if any of you know, Haddon Robertson, who's a great uh, American preacher, wrote uh, a classic book on preaching. And he once described preaching as the art of talking in somebody else's sleep. Now, I appreciate that it's late tonight and we're getting on a bit and at some point we might go past some of your bedtimes and some of you have been travelling and perhaps quite tired from travelling and so I, I aim to keep this to the point tonight so that I don't end up talking in anybody else's sleep. But this week I do want to look at this great chapter of the Bible, a chapter you'll be very familiar with, Luke 15, with a focus eventually on, on the prodigal son. We're going to take some detours before we get there. But we do have some important things to do first in order to really get to grips with some of the details in that parable. Now, Luke 15 contains the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. Tomorrow we'll look at how that whole chapter fits together because it really needs to be taken together. Jesus didn't preach uh, three separate parables in different places. He preached these together because they fit together well. Thursday we'll focus on the details on the lost son and tonight we're simply going to do uh, some background, some foundational stuff. We're going to dig some, some, some groundwork tonight, which can be difficult, especially as it's late, but it's beneficial, I believe, hopefully by the end. And um, I was tempted to kind of skip the foundations and just go straight into it, but Jesus had some important things to say about laying foundations, so we're going to do that to start with. The background of Jesus' parables in this chapter is found in verse 3. Verse 3 says, Jesus told them this parable. Who's them that he's speaking to? Because this is going to shape what Jesus says. Verse 2 tells us who them is. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They're the audience. In other words, the religious leaders, the experts in the Old Testament. Now here's a, a tip for you, a free tip. That um, when you're studying scripture and you're looking at Jesus' words, his words are going to be shaped by the people that he's talking to. And so if Jesus is speaking to the experts in the Old Testament, what are we going to expect from Jesus' words? We're going to expect they will be shaped by Old Testament language, by Old Testament pictures and images and passages. And so we must ask ourselves the question, what is the background from the Old Testament that shapes what Jesus says to these Old Testament experts. Well, there's a number of background passages to this. Take, for example, the story of Joseph in Genesis, at the end of Genesis. There are a number of very interesting par parallels between Joseph and the lost son. In Genesis, we're told that Jacob had many sons and the older brothers despised Joseph, the younger brother, uh, their father's favouritism made them angry and made them despise Joseph. And that's not a million miles away from what we have at the end of this parable in Luke 15. The older brother is angry at his father's favourable treatment towards the younger brother and despises him as a result. And just as in the case of Joseph, the younger brother goes away to a distant country, although under very different circumstances in verse 13, goes away to a distant country, as with Joseph and Jacob. The father believes his son is dead. Do you remember? In the story of Joseph, Jacob believes that Joseph is dead. Or well, here in verses 24, verses 32, he believes his son was dead. Just as with Joseph, there's a severe famine in the land in verse 14. And so there's these parallels between those stories. Also, the father's treatment of the prodigal echoes Pharaoh's treatment of Joseph. Do you remember? Look at verse 22. Bring the best robe, put the best robe on him, ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Very similar to how Pharaoh treats Joseph. Genesis 41 verse 42. Pharaoh took his ring from his finger, put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in his best robes with a gold chain around his neck. And then the reunion between the father and the prodigal here is reminiscent of the reunion between the father and son, Jacob and Joseph, in Genesis. Genesis 46 tells us Joseph threw his arms round his father. Luke 15 says the father threw his arms round the son. And it's the exact same language. I, I don't know if you know that um, by the time Jesus was born, the Old Testament, which as you will know was written in Hebrew, had been translated into Greek that the New Testament would be written in. And it's the exact same language. It literally says that uh, he fell on his neck. 
It's the word, uh, it's the word trachea. He, he fell on his throat, which in, in Greek is a, a lovely, loving expression. If we said that in English, that you fell on somebody's trachea, that would probably have different connotations, wouldn't it? But it's the same, same like his echoes of, of Job's, not accidental echoes. I don't think Jesus is hitting on these, these story beats, <coughs> these story elements that would have been familiar to these Old Testament experts. But the immediate background to the prodigal son is not found in Genesis, but a few books later in the book of Deuteronomy. If you want to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 21, I say we'll take some detours, but this is the groundwork, really. The things that Jesus didn't have to explain to these Old Testament experts because they knew it. And perhaps we don't know our Old Testaments quite as well as they would have done. So if we turn to Deuteronomy chapter 21, this is part of the law that Jesus' audience were experts in. So they knew these chapters well. And if we can familiarise ourselves with this background, we'll understand the prodigal son perhaps a bit better. Now, the relevant part of Deuteronomy 21 I want to look at begins with verse 15, although that's, um, that's not an easy place to start because verse 15 says, if a man has two wives... It's a bit too late in the day to start a discussion on polygamy in the Old Testament, although that was a can of worms that Wes did slightly open for us um, a few moments ago with 1 Samuel. So having opened that can of worms, we can't really just allow it to uh, do whatever worms do, I don't know, get caught by early birds or something like that, don't know. But um, maybe say something about this before we go on. If you want to have a chat about polygamy in the Old Testament, have a breakfast tomorrow, that, that's fine. But... Um, Simply to say this, Deuteronomy 21 has been dealing with the issue of war. The people of Israel often attacked and often had to go out in battle against other pagan nations. Wars created widows as a result. And unlike today where we have the safety nets in our culture of the welfare state, of state benefits, of insurance, of food banks, of many other dispensations like that, to be a widow in the ancient Near East was, was a death knell. Which is why God places such an emphasis, at least one of the reasons God places such an emphasis on caring for widows and orphans. They were the vulnerable people in the society. To be a widow was to be potentially destitute, no income, no inheritance, no offspring, no heirs, which were big deals in the ancient Near East. So God allowed the Israelite men, to take the widows created by war, as of course it would have been the men fighting the war there, he allowed them to take these widows under their care so they had somebody to provide for them. It was a mercy by God. It was not ideal. We know what God's ideal is for marriage in the Bible, his plan for marriage. But in a messy, sinful world, you have these difficult situations and God allowed in these circumstances for these men to care for the widows of war. The widows, we're told, must be treated kindly and with dignity, given the proper time to grieve for their lost husbands, dressed in new clothes, clean clothes, not forced into marriage, not treated as property, which they certainly would have been done by the pagan nations around them. So, um, but this uh, section that starts in verse 15 then raises a follow-up issue. It says, if you have multiple wives, I don't know if this is relevant to you today, but uh, if you have multiple wives, it says you, you're likely to have multiple children. Now, if you've watched many Disney movies, you will know that from time to time, stepchildren aren't treated particularly well. You know, Disney movies have created this idea of the, uh, the wicked stepmother, you know, Cinderella and Snow White and that sort of thing. But God's law says here in Deuteronomy 21, that although a husband's may in some cases have loved one wife more than another, and although one of his wives may have been a widow that he's simply caring for, nevertheless he must not show favouritism between the sons that were born to those marriages. Instead he must treat them according to the law. And the law stated that the firstborn son must have a position of responsibility in the family, because as the oldest he'd be expected to care for his family to protect his family, to organise them. So the firstborn son was to get a double portion of the inheritance. So, for example, if a father had two sons, he would divide his property into, into three portions. The eldest would get the double, two-thirds, and the younger would get 
the one remaining third. That is the background to Luke 15, where the younger son says, can I have my share? In other words, can I have my one third of your property? Everything that remains, therefore, the two thirds that was left after the prodigal leaves his father's house, belong to the older brother. So when you get down to verse 31 in Luke 15, the father says to the older brother, all I have is yours. He's not exaggerating there. Literally everything in the estate belongs now to the older brother. So literally everything the father owned was his. But here's where it gets interesting in Deuteronomy, hopefully. After Deuteronomy 21 explains how to divide up your inheritance between sons, which is how Luke 15 starts, the lost son, the very next section tells you how to deal with a rebellious son, with, with a prodigal son. There's no accidents in scripture, and Jesus really is the master storyteller. I, I don't, obviously, I've prepared what I'm going to say tonight. I don't know if Jesus prepared what he had to say in Luke 15. Did he just come up with this on the spot? The, the, the master storyteller creating these, these stories seemingly out of thin air, perhaps. So we've got dividing your property, as happens in Luke 15, and then dealing with a rebellious son. Well, that's the next thing in Luke 15, isn't it? But then the plot thickens. Because Deuteronomy 21 imagines how parents of a rebellious son might go about punishing that son. And the punishment is severe. If you read Deuteronomy 21, he'd be put to death for his rebellion. And so it comes up with a hypothetical situation. Say, for example, imagine your son has committed these kind of crimes. What are you going to do? They could have chosen any example. Imagine you've got a son who's a thief or a liar, or a murderer, or an adulterer. But what was the example that God chose, the case study that God chose in Deuteronomy 21? Look at verse 20. Here you've got the parents of this rebellious son. They, they go to the, the city elders and they say, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. Well, what's he done? He is two things, a glutton and a drunkard. Of all of the crimes that a rebellious prodigal son could have been accused of, Deuteronomy decides the one it is going to verbalise is being a glutton and a drunkard. Why is that relevant? If you know your New Testament, you know why that's very relevant. Because uh, the things, the glutton and a drunkard, um, is something that we find in Luke's Gospel just before the story of the prodigal son in Luke 7. We know that there's another son in the Bible, who is accused of being a glutton and a drunkard. Luke 7, verse 34, the son, the son of man, came eating and drinking, and you say he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. A friend of tax collectors and sinners, which is how Luke 15 begins with the prodigal son. You see how this is sort of tying together. So what are the Pharisees saying when they accuse Jesus the son of man, of being a glutton and a drunk. What are they saying? They are saying Jesus is the rebellious son of Deuteronomy chapter 21. Jesus is the prodigal. He's the rebel. He's the sinner. They're saying Jesus deserves to die because the law says that gluttons and drunkards, rebellious sons, ought to die for their rebellion. They are saying Jesus deserves to die as the law in Deuteronomy 21 says. And how did Deuteronomy 21 say parents should punish their son, who's a glutton and a drunk? Well, the very next section tells us in Deuteronomy 21, we say, if someone guilty of a capital offence, like the son was, is put to death, usually by stoning, their body is exposed on a pole or a tree. You must not leave the body hanging on the pole overnight. Okay, so Deuteronomy 21 is picturing somebody's been put to death by stoning, their body is taken outside of the city, the body is hung on a tree uh, to demonstrate God's justice. Purge the sin from among you, the passage says. How did the religious leaders kill Jesus after they accused him of being a glutton and a drunk? Well, they took him before the elders, didn't they? Just as in Deuteronomy 21, Jesus prophesied, I'll be taken before the chief priests and the elders. And they had his body hung on a tree outside the city as if he were the rebellious son. And Deuteronomy 21 says, 
Do not leave the body hanging overnight. It must be taken down the same day. What happened to Jesus' body hanging outside the city? Well, quite unlike most crucifixions, Jesus died the same day. Notably, his body was not left hanging on the cross overnight, fulfilling the image that we're given in Deuteronomy 21. And just in case we hadn't made the link, or just in case you think I've stretched this link too far between Deuteronomy and Jesus, the very next verses in Deuteronomy say, but be sure you bury the body the same day, because cursed is anyone who is hung on a tree. It's exactly what Paul quotes in Galatians 3.13, and he applies it to Jesus. Christ redeemed us from the law, the curse of the law, by becoming a curse for us. For it is written in Deuteronomy chapter 21, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Can you see the, the, the beautiful way that scripture fits together here? You have these skeptics who, in some cases I think have never read the Bible, and they say, ah, oh, it's just a load of people throughout history writing these different ideas, primitive ideas. No, it hangs together beautifully. We could even go into the next few verses in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 22 opens with a command not to ignore lost sheep, but bring them back home safely, which is, of course, how Luke 15 begins. So you see, again, these things tying together. Let me just recap one sec. There's a lot of information there. Deuteronomy 21 speaks of a firstborn son. It tells of a, re a rebellious son who is accused of being a glutton and a drunk. The son is killed by the elders, the religious leaders, taken outside the city, hung on a tree, taken down the same day, because the one who is hung on a tree is under the curse of God. What does Luke tell us? Jesus is the firstborn son. He's the one of privilege. He's accused of being a rebellious son, a glutton and a drunk. He is killed by the elders outside the city. His body is hung on a tree, not left overnight, taken down the same day. And the curse of God against rebellious sons and daughters falls on Jesus. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. What law? Well, the law that includes Deuteronomy 21. He redeemed us from these punishments, these consequences. The law that punishes rebellious people fell on Jesus. The curse upon rebellious people is placed on the body of Jesus on the cross so that rebels and sinners and prodigals may go free. Now we enjoy the things the prodigal enjoys in Luke 15. We enjoy the fat of the calf. We enjoy the music and the dancing that that prodigal enjoyed when he returns home. We get treated like we're the firstborn sons with a robe wrapped around us and the ring on our finger, the sandals on our feet, all because the firstborn son of God was treated as if he were the prodigal. He were the rebellious son of Deuteronomy. Jesus, in a way you could say, is the perfect prodigal. <laughs> he left his father's house to go to a distant country as he entered the world as the man Christ Jesus. He, like the prodigal, went from the riches of his father's home into poverty. He was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. He endured a severe famine on the cross as he cried out, I am thirsty. He endured the pigsty of our sin and our shame that we were wallowing in. And like the father said to the prodigal when he returned home, he said, my son was dead and is alive again. So the father, God the father, could say of Jesus, my son was dead and is alive again. And that's why Jesus can receive prodigals home without sweeping their sin under the carpet. That's why he can say, bring out the best robe, put a ring on their finger. The reason Jesus can treat sinners as sons is because Jesus, the son, is treated as if he was the sinner. He, he was treated as if he squandered the father's inheritance, as if he'd rejected the father, as if he'd wandered off, as if he were the prodigal. The famous Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon said, and um, I hope I get this quote right, he said, when I look at Jesus, I'm filled with wonder and awe. And that's good. But when God looks at Jesus, when the Father looks at Jesus, that's when I'm saved. Because the Father sees Jesus as the one who has taken my sin and my curse. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us.